Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Open Mic VO for Sunday, May 13th. It's been a few weeks since we've met, so so nice to see you all in the uh, in the audience again. I've um, was traveling two weeks ago. I had just returned from the UK, where I had attended the One Voice conference in London, which was absolutely fabulous. And then uh, I returned from London on the Sunday. On the Thursday, I got sick, and I've been sick ever since. But I didn't want to cancel it for a third uh, night in a row tonight, so I thought that I'd log in and, uh, and we'd make things happen here. Uh, Open Mic VO is, uh, you know, we all get together here on Sunday evenings and chat about topics of interest to voice actors. Uh, nothing too terribly uh, structured or intense. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them, whether you're a brand new to the industry or you've been in it for a while. Uh, just a couple of ground rules I'd like to go over. First of all, uh, once I unmute you, I'm going to be doing that in just a couple of moments. Please mute yourself in the lower left-hand corner of the Zoom meeting ID box, the window. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, of course, if you've got something to contribute, if you've got a question to ask. Definitely want to encourage you to participate. But if you're not actively in the conversation at that moment, if you could please mute yourself so we don't have problems with uh, uh, background noise and echoes and things like that. Um, second rule is be nice to each other. Um, we were all new once and we all have different opinions and perspectives on things. So let's make sure that we treat each other professionally and respectfully and that uh, we don't get into any sort of negativity tonight. And the third thing is, please remember that I record these uh, open mic videos and I post them to YouTube. So if you share any information that might be proprietary or confidential, just keep in mind that once it gets posted to YouTube, um, it's not as if there's thousands of people checking it out. Trust me, there's only a handful of people that go to each episode. But just remember that I can't, a guarantee to keep it confidential. So with that said, I'm really counting on you guys tonight to carry the conversation because my voice, as you can tell, is terrible. And um, I'm really trying to preserve it because I've got two very important voiceover jobs tomorrow. So as much as you guys can carry the conversation tonight, that'd be okay with me. I'm calling tonight shiny object night. Any a uh, topic that attracts our attention is uh, a topic that's uh, good enough for tonight's conversation. So if it's got anything to do with VO whatsoever, voiceover performance, voiceover marketing, getting voiceover work, um, home studio questions are welcome. Uh, just feel free to reach on out and, and, to, uh, and to get us started once I start unmuting people. If you are shy, you can also post your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Either one of those places, I'll be keeping my eyes on them, and I can po um, pose your question for you if you're feeling particularly shy or you don't have access to a microphone tonight. <clears throat> so with that said, let me start to unmute people here. Happy Mother's Day, by the way, to all of us who are here tonight and who are mothers. So glad that you're taking a few minutes out of your family time to check in with us here on Open Mic VO. Hi, Graham. Hey, Dave. How are you tonight? Good. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you great. Hey, Graham, I've, I've been doing voiceovers for a while. Uh, my first one was in 1979. You've been doing them quite a while. Yeah, the industry's changed a lot. I see a little gray hair in uh, in, in yours. So I, I I'm I'm used to a different industry. I'm pretty technologically uh, hip. Um, I have a nice home studio and the whole thing. In the past, it was a whole different world. And and you newbies, it, it's you have no idea how much it's changed and how 
I guess luxurious it is now to have a home studio and be able to record stuff and everything. Um, I, I do other businesses, not a full-time gig for me, but tomorrow I have a meeting with a coach. Can I say her name? No, of course you can, if you'd like to share it. Do you know Kate McClanahan? I know Kate McClanahan dearly. She's, she's awesome. Um, I, m the problem I'm having is that at, I do the standard four, five, six auditions a day on voices.com and, and, and a couple others. And, and I'm just not getting any freaking traction. And, um, it, it's not a question of ability. Uh, I've been doing voiceovers for a long time, but these pay to play ones, I just can't get any traction. And I, I'm going to her to number one, get some coaching and, 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 and that's always helpful. But trying to figure out how to get traction on these pay to play. So my question is, uh, you, you know, Kate very well. She seems fantastic. She's a Midwestern woman. She's amazingly accomplished and, uh, and I like her style, but I am I wasting my time with a coach before going to the pay to plays? I honestly don't think you ever waste your time with a coach. Um, I, I think that whether you're brand new to the business, you should be taking coaching. I know voice actors who've been in the business for 40 years, they still take coaching. Um, okay. I think it's important to do that in order to stay on top of your game. And I still take coaching all the time. Uh, Kate is awesome. Here's my advice with Kate. And I, I'm not going to tell you anything I wouldn't say in front of her face. Kate, Good. You're paying by the hour. Make sure that she doesn't dawdle off into too many little side conversations. Sometimes it's hard to keep her focused. So okay. <laughs> make sure you stay on point. That's all. Like have a very specific list of questions and make sure you stay on topic with her because otherwise she'll have you all over the place. She's fascinating to talk to. I mean, she's got a thousand stories. She's, as you say, she kind of grew up in Detroit and she lived in Chicago for much of her career. And now she's in LA and doing well as a coach out there. But uh, she, she's got a thousand stories and she'll tell you all of them if you let, if you let her. Okay, that's great. Uh, so I've, I've, I, it's, it, I'm going to talk to her and another one. I haven't settled completely on Kate. There's another one I'm talking to. But um, the pay to play thing, let me switch gears here. How do people get traction on this? And is it, I, I look at the top 10 and on, uh, let's just take one, voices.com for a while. And it seems like the same guys. Is there any hope? Is it just a waste of time doing the pay to plays? Uh, um, it depends on who you ask. You know, Pareto's law applies in online casting just like it does almost everywhere. And that is that 80% of the business goes to 20% of the talent. Right. So the key is to get yourself into one, being one of those 20% of the talent. You know, it's not to be discouraged by the fact that, you know, you're not getting the work. It's just to figure out the formula to make sure you're in that 20%. Yeah. The toughest one for me is they, uh, and I, I, I studied voiceover. I, I, I love it. And for everybody who's listening, I don't know how many are on this. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It is an art. It's a talent. It's something that you have to work on and there, there's a lot to it. And it's, it's very um, satisfying when things work out and you, and you get money. I mean, I go back, I was one of the voices of Miller beer back in the eighties, but I'm having a tough time transitioning into this conversational young voice world that we live in. Everybody want, they want everybody to sound like a, 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 a millennial is 24 years old and has no training and he's just conversational. And, and uh, it's, it's a tough transition for me. Yeah. It's not that they want everyone to sound like a millennial, but they do want everyone to sound natural. The old days of the eighties, um, you know, the, the big, beer voices and stuff. And although you'd never know by listening to me right now, I have actually done a fair amount of beer stuff and uh, they're just looking for very thrown off, natural, no mm. kind of pretense whatsoever. They're not looking for the big announcer sound at all. Um, and right. Kate or any good coach, um, you see you're, you're investigating another coach as well. Um, you know, either Kate or, you know, whoever else you choose will be able to help you with that because, I mean, that's been the fashion in voiceover now for over 10 years. And, you know, consistently you see at the top of every casting sheet, no announcers, no announcers. We don't want anyone right. to look like an announcer. 
Um, yeah. Often they do want an announcer, but they just want someone that sounds somewhat natural. That's all. Okay. Well, we'll forge ahead. By the way, the microphone I'm using is an AT. It's a, I'm testing it out this week. Uh, I got a friend who does, uh, he's got a podcast and he wanted a new mic. And this is the AT 2020 USB plus. Yeah. And I'm, I'm impressed by it. It's a pretty nice little microphone. It's a great mic. Um, I've used AT, uh, AT 2020s on the road in the past. Um, yeah. And I have a, an AT 2020 USB here somewhere because I'd given it to my daughter who had an interest in voiceover at one point. So, yeah, I, I, I highly recommend that mic for $129, I think it is. It's an amazing, an amazing value. I, I, I would never use it in the studio. It's tr strictly a travel mic for somebody. Um, I have other stuff that I use on the road. Uh, it, it's an impressive little mic. If somebody's looking for something, uh, it, it's, it's really quiet it's 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 got some nice features to it and it's a, it's a good little travel mic if you need a usb mic fantastic well it's uh, great to have you here tonight dave thank you thanks for the time i appreciate it not at all hi graham hello gary uh feel better that's the main thing here tonight so, thank you so much if i disappear off camera in a second it's going to be because <laughs> i'm hacking in the corner i hear you uh or, or hopefully i don't hear you i suppose but anyway that aside uh, to save Graham's voice, maybe this can go out to the entire audience, but I'm, I'm looking to uh, chase the e-learning aspect of my business. And uh, uh, in order to get off the ground, obviously I need a good demo. Um, my question is, I have heard it both ways that you do not need any background music on a demo. And then I've heard uh, other people say, well, it's nice to have some background music depending on the content of what my demo would be. So I'm just trying to get some feedback to some of the ex from Patrick. some of the experienced people. Come here. Come here, buddy. Let's come on you a little bit, okay? Okay. Let me take care of that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what happens when you don't mute yourself. Um in my experience, I have never done a, a demo that didn't have some sort of sound effects, uh, other than an audiobook demo. They didn't have some sort of sound effects or, or music or something in the background. Now, much of e-learning doesn't necessarily have um, music behind it. And that, you know, obviously it makes sense. You want people focused on the content that you're delivering. But sometimes um, I've had demos um, in the past where someone will say, you know, enter your name now. And then you, uh, someone like the producer actually dropped in a few typewriter clicks, like keyboard clicks uh, to make it sound as if someone was entering their name so that it sounded as if there was a real kind of back and forth story happening between you and the participant in the e-learning program. Um, Anybody else have any thoughts on using music or sound effects in e-learning demos? I can understand the sound effects background. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Anthea. Hi, Graham. Hello, Anthea. <laughs> Get better soon. Thank you so much. Um, this is uh, something that I, this kind of applies to what Gary is saying. Um, there is actually a really nice Facebook group, um, an e-learning Facebook group, and I don't have the address right offhand, but if you look up e-learning on Facebook, I know they've had this discussion before, and I can't remember everything that was said, but there were cases that they brought up where something was okay, and other cases where they said it was good to have it straight but there they were really helpful i was just kind of browsing and looking through but if you look on facebook and look up e-learning um and see if you can find that group there uh they seem to be really helpful and uh just kind of was adding that to see you know yeah very good anthea i really do appreciate that i never even thought of that uh, i will check into that there's a couple of really good e-learning Facebook groups, actually. So um, that's a good idea, Anthea.
So I'm just making some notes here. Can I add one more thing too? Please. Um, this is for uh, this is for Dave G. Um, I'm still considered a newbie, but I have talked to um, I had a coach, and his comment was, if you go on pay to play, he said you have to watch for the auditions very closely because the minute it shows up, you need to be in like the top twelve people they listen to. Uh, because sometimes, you know, they won't go any further than that. They'll just listen to the top people and then they stop listening. You know, and I, Anthea, that's, that's a bit of, um, that's a bit of a urban myth. Is it? Okay. Yeah. You know, actually, if I think it's voice one, two, three, I don't think it's voices. I think it's voice one, two, three, actually both of them in both cases, you know, whether your audition was listened to or not. And it's oh, okay. very rarely on either of the two platforms that my submission wasn't listened to. Um, and on voice one, two, three, it will actually tell you of the total number of submissions received, how many in total were listened to by the, uh, by the casting person. So you know, of uh, 77 auditions received, they listened to 56 of them. Um, uh, you That's can, awesome. and in my experience going through those numbers, it, the, there's a reasonably good chance. There's, there's a reasonably good chance that your audition is going to be listened to. I think that your friend though, does have a, a, a good point in that often if you're in early and you kind of set the tone for what, you know, a good audition is supposed to sound like, then you might be more successful. Uh, J. Michael Collins, who's you know, famous for his courses on, you know, doing your best on online casting sites will often say that it's, e it's much easier if you're in early. But I don't want people being discouraged thinking that their auditions never get listened to because they really do. That's good to know. Thank you. I just, I'm glad I said something because I learned a lot. Thanks. No problem. Graham, I agree. Uh, uh, rarely are my auditions not listened to on Voices.com, and that's the good part. Absolutely. Um, but, you, but if you're 120th, uh, chances are uh, remote that you're going to get the gig. Uh, there's so much talent out there. It's just, it's just unlikely. You'd be surprised, though, Dave, is that uh, you know, on voice one, two, three, because I know people that have, you know, gone in and used voice one, two, three from the other side as, as someone searching for voices. And if on a voice one, two, three typical job, let's say it's 300 bucks or something like that. If there's 80 submissions, almost guaranteed is that 40 of them are going to, um, are going to disqualify themselves based on something absolutely clear right off the top their technical their technical uh, quality is not good enough you know they're recording in their kitchen or in their bathroom shower or something and it just sounds horrible or they clearly have had no training and and they just don't kind of know where to start when it comes to reading a piece of commercial copy so you can pretty much discount 40 of them right off the top so that now leaves 40 and I don't know, a one in 40 chance when it comes to doing, when it comes to auditions, I wish my agent always gave me that good odds. Because I often feel is that when I'm submitting stuff through my agent is that I'm one of a hundred people that are being listened to by the casting director. One of the other things that's important too is to follow directions. If you, if that says slate at the end or slate at the beginning, or slate with the character name or something like that, make sure that you read the directions and follow the directions. You can be disqualified for simply not following directions. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Na file naming. I mean, if there's one more file that gets sent and it's, and it's called audio underscore one or something, I mean, you deserve to lose the job. So... Oh, here's a little tip for as far as number of auditions listened to on voice one, two, three. If you look at a job, this has say like 56 auditions submitted and there's only been 15 listened to, the odds are they've already picked the person they want. 
Jim, I agree with you. If, if the job's been open for a day and if there were 66 and only 15 got listened to, then I agree there's a pretty good chance that uh, <coughs> excuse me, please. There's a pretty good chance they found their, their, their voice. Got a uh, this is Anthea. Hey there. Um, hi there. Can I ask a can I ask a question here? Please. What makes a great slate? A non-existent one, usually. <laughs> um, the only time I ever slate anything is when my agent specifically asks me to. Like when it comes to anything online. I never slate anything either. Some people say, well, don't slate at the beginning, maybe do it what they call a tail slate or slate at the end. I don't even do that. I don't slate at all. Um, Edge Studio actually came up with about 18 months or two years ago, a great guide on slating. Um, and if you go to the Edge Studio website and just do a search for slating guide or slating manual, they did a whole white paper on it and it's really quite well done. Um, worth checking out. So edgestudio.com and then just do a search for slating guide. But yeah. their recommendation at the time was um, no slate is generally the right slate. Yeah, on P2Ps and things like that. But uh, with um, my agent, uh, I'm expected to slate. And usually when it comes through uh, the email, it will say the slate at top or top slate or, or tail slate or something like that. But one of the things that I learned from a very – well-respected coach in New York City is the shoulder shrug. A lot of people are not comfortable saying their own names, but if you say it with a slight shoulder shrug and you're comfortable with it, that, that sets the tone right away. James, do you ever um, uh, slate in character? Uh, Sometimes it's required. Sometimes it will be in the instructions. They want you to slate in character. Mm -hmm. It depends on what it is. Um, I just had an audition a few weeks ago for a video game that I won through my agent, and I did six different characters, and I slated in each of those characters' voices. So, yes, I do slate in character. Um, I noticed that Michael Schwalbe's here tonight. Um Michael, I know that most of your work is video games and character work. Do you tend to slate uh, in character or do you slate at all? Uh, it depends on the project um, and it depends on the agent. Uh, for instance, at CESD, I have one agent that likes slates in character and one that doesn't. So depending on who sends it to me, I will slate in the way that they want me to and that's the real answer is just ask your agent how they want you to slate if you're not represented then yeah either no slate or just your name um is all don't add anything else so in your case at, at, with the cesd literally there's two agents and they want you to use different different yeah so in the animation um and video game department. Uh, Pat Brady likes you to slate just in your normal voice and Kathy likes you to slate in your character voice. So if Kathy sends me one, I slate in character and if Pat sends me one, I slate with my normal voice. Well then that clearly proves that the real answer is it doesn't matter because yeah. he's one of the best, one of the best uh, voiceover agencies in the world. And the fact that they're not even consistent indicates that it's really not that big a deal. Yeah, same with file naming conventions. Uh, all six of my agents there uh, ask for files named different ways. Um, just do what your agent wants you to and, uh, and get out of your own way uh, if you're not auditioning for agencies. I personally, my, my views on slating have changed a lot over the last few years. I went from never slating ever to slating, tail slating, just my name at the very end, thinking like if they've made it that far, they care about who I am. Um, and you also don't want to, like since you have seven seconds of attention, you want as much of it to be the read as possible. But now uh, I, I think putting your name at the very front, especially if you're somebody like me that has a pretty unique last name, uh, the more 
casting directors and decision makers out there that remember the name Schwalbe the better uh, for my career. And that's so uh, that's why I like putting my name up front. But uh, now nah, anyway, but there's an argument to be made um, every single way. Yeah, but even on top of that, Michael, you don't want to get too cutesy with it either. It's like, oh, hi, no I'm Michael Schwabe, and I want you to listen to this. You know, it's, no, uh, just it, your name. Just, just your name. That's just it. You know, a lot of people want to do, you know, be what I call a little too cute by half. Um, they want to they want to be your friend. They want to get the job so bad they want to be your friend. And no, you just tell, say, state your name. That's it. People want professionals, not friends. Exactly. Michael, you've been in Los Angeles for a year now almost, haven't you? Uh, about seven or eight months, yeah. Yeah. Any regrets looking back now that you've moved to the, the big city? Uh, no, no regrets. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, an adventure. You know, yeah, just be ready for whatever opportunities there are and say yes and be prepared to drive in a lot of traffic if it means getting in front of the right people. and spend a lot of money <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it's a it's an amazing city and there's a lot of amazing opportunities out here do you do a lot of those what i'll call workshops in air quotes which are really just you have to pay a 100 bucks in order to meet a casting director do you do those things uh i don't do a lot of them but i've i've done three or four maybe um uh, i was going to do a fifth one uh at the recommendation of my agent um but i had to travel so i had to miss it but that's sad but yeah i mean it's just kind of how it it is out here and especially for like if you want to get los angeles representation there's really not a better way to than to like find one of these meet the pros like or or meet the agent a little seminar or gatherings, whatever, and, and just do some copy for them. Uh, I've seen a lot of people that had very limited portfolios. You know, they, they didn't have the big laundry list of clients or bookings that they could impress them through like the typical submission. Um, and I've seen some talent get on very serious agencies uh, very early in their careers doing that. So there's an argument for that too. Yeah. I've never understood how those meet the, meet the pros nights pass muster when it comes to, you know, the laws against that kind of stuff in both New York and in, and in California. Well, those laws are pretty new. Um, and I think so far there's only been really one casting director that has gotten in trouble for it, but, uh, and some of them are, are more legit than others. You know, like when I did one um, for a director who does a lot of promo stuff and it was, it legitimately like, it's not just pay to like get heard. It's like we, there were 12 of us. And so all of us did, I don't know, two or three pieces of copy each and getting to watch the other guys get directed uh, and the feedback that this director gave to everybody um, you know, for over a course of three hours was, you know, it'd just be the same as an X session at, at voice, uh, Atlanta or whatever. Um, so, so some of them, a lot of them are really pretty helpful. Um, there have been, there was one that the director, we all sat outside and then went in one by one to do a couple pieces of copy and that lasted maybe 15 minutes and that, so that kind of sucked. But, uh, you know, it, I, I, I'm neutral on it. Um, I see how it could be predatory, but then I'm also, uh, uh, see how it could be a learning experience and also a great networking opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I know that when you had gone out to Los Angeles, you were quite interested in, you know, pursuing your promo career. Has that been uh, continuing to work out for you? Uh, yeah, I've had more promo bookings with my agency than, uh, other, genres i did uh some nickelodeon promo and some promo for uh like some phone app stuff and some some radio promo so it's it's cool um promo is a, a weird beast because a lot of it like if you get the the very consistent stuff you're it's you're handcuffed to the microphone but um otherwise you know it's it's real turn and burn doesn't pay a whole lot uh you know it airs for a week and then it's gone so you kind of have to keep your nose to the grindstone to make a living doing promo until you land something that's like a, a recurring 
gig. But, uh, you know, I'm out here for the, for the long haul. So <laughs> however long it takes is fine by me. Well, Michael, yeah. so, so glad that you're with us tonight. We haven't seen you in a little while. And, uh, you know, thanks for checking back in. If I'm not mistaken, Michael, didn't you just get your union card recently? Uh, no, it's been a year and a well, half, a couple year. year or two. You're in the union, though. Yeah, I am. I'm FICOR. Oh, you're FICOR. So you can't go to the VO lab. I was going to ask you if you ever went to the VO lab there. Uh, I haven't been to the VO lab yet. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't even really. I know that there's a ruling in New York where uh, if you're FICOR, you can't participate in it. So it's that's oh. a shame. It's different. Well, I, you don't even I, need to be a member of the union at all. You know, that's, well, that's cool. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't heard anything about that, but I also haven't really looked into it. So if, Yeah. Well, I, I would suggest that you do because it's invaluable. I mean, you'll meet people there that will help you. The ghost of Don LaFontaine, even. <laughs> exactly. Hey, and, guys, what's the law that you were talking about? Could you uh, enlighten us, uh, the, the laws in the, uh, that you're referring to about these casting people? What, what's that law? In, Thank Cal you. in California, there was something called the Kerkorian, Kerkorian, I believe it is, Act, uh, that was passed, I don't know, you, you, Michael, I think you're right, it doesn't go back that long, five, six years maybe. But basically, it is illegal for... And it, it lists a number of things. It specifies what an agent is, what a, you know, what a manager is, how much they're allowed to take of your earnings, that kind of stuff. But one of them is that um, if you are an agent or a casting director, you're not allowed to charge people to audition. And these workshops that they offer are pretty... Um, thinly veiled, you know, opportunities to pay to get in front of a casting director to audition. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a gray area from a legal standpoint. Um, if you just do a Google search under the, I think it's K-E-R-K-O-R-I-A-N, Kerkorian Act. Yeah, and there what there are a lot that? of these kind of there are a lot of these kind of things in New York City too. Uh, a number of them are organizations like uh, Actors Connection and uh, One on One. Um, there are organizations who bring casting people, directors, agents, uh, even people involved in television production in, and basically they give you a, about a half hour talk about what they do in the industry and who they are and what they represent. And then if it's an agent, you will get a one-on-one -on -one audition with them or something like that. You can read copy or you can do a scene or something like that. Same thing with casting directors, but they get around it by offering, you know, this is what we do. This is what our office is like. This is the kind of thing we're looking for. Uh, and we're always looking for a wonderful new talent, blah, 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 blah. So you pay a little bit of fee. You sit in a class with, anywhere from 12 to 25 people and you get an opportunity to meet these people, but you pay for that. Yeah. It's a little shady, I think. So it was bad enough for the lawmakers to say, we have to instill rules. We have to write down rules for this and make a law of it. I wasn't aware it was that being abused by. Well, certain... It's really primarily an issue in the on-camera business. Um, on-camera can, can get very predatory. Uh, at times, it's it's a lesser issue with voiceover. Uh, I get it. Yeah, yeah. It, it was very much an issue of, oh, well, if you want to, um, you know, meet our casting director, well, you have to go to our photographer to have your headshots taken first. And I mean, it became this. It, it was really gross. It really is. Um, the the amount of predatory practices on the, you know the the ignorant and i use the word ignorant in the truest sense of the word um yeah it's a shame how how people are taken advantage of so yeah there was uh the law exists in new york and in california i don't know if a version of it exists elsewhere or not <clears throat> maybe they'll rename it the weinstein rule could could be 
Well, that's that's sexual predatory. That's a that's a completely different thing. I mean, these people are out to make money on people who don't know any better. Yeah. Uh, say, you know, if an agent uh, wants to take you on, but they also want you to uh, pay them to have your headshots, or they have a, what they call a maintenance fee, uh, run the other way. They're not legit. Thank you. So who else has got some questions for us tonight? It's shiny object night, which means that any questions that attract our attention uh, are worthy of conversation. Anything to do with the voiceover business. Uh, it could be performance related, home studio related, um, business and marketing, whatever's on your mind. Hey, Graham. Hi, Graham. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, this is Michael Sessoms in Dallas, and Hello, uh, I do some uh, voice casting on uh, uh, Voice One Two Three. Okay. And I listen to everybody that does a submittal. Well, thank you for that. Well, everybody, everybody who submits an audition will ensure that they at least get a listen to. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very Absolutely. much because I, not everybody does that as we've discussed earlier. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, that's for sure. Uh, but I'm trying to find the best voice, you know, for what I need. And uh, the only way I can do that is by listening to all of them. Um, you know, granted that uh, you do find some issues like we were talking about earlier with, uh, you know, lack of quality of the recording. Uh, some of the other stuff though that you run into is they're not in the moment you know they like say you've got them beating up zombies and uh, they're just going oh look at him over there ow you know it, which is how some of these reads come across so it you know i really do look for them being in the moment and uh being able to take direction. So, Michael, when I said earlier that in a typical, a, a typical casting with 80 submissions, that 40 of them probably immediately are discounted because of technical flaws or just, you know, clearly they're just not up to par. Does that sound about right? Is it 50-50? It really depends. You know, it, it depends on who's submitting. A lot of times, I guess maybe about a third or a fourth, I can guarantee that probably we'll have some technical issues or, or they're not, um, they're not really in the script. You know, yeah. you can tell they're just reading the script. And so I can just throw those out right away. Michael, you're looking more for performance. That's the most important thing for you at Absolutely. technical first and then the performance. Absolutely. Michael, as a general rule, when you hire somebody from one of the online casting sites, are you having them record the final product at home? Yes. So yes, technical is important to you as well then? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need them to do music and effects and other things like that. Just need them to be able to do the efforts to, uh, you know, be able to do the acting. Uh, Paula, you had a question you were trying to jump in there with. I did. I just was curious. Um, I, I know you're trying to save your voice, but I was really curious about your impressions of the One Voice Conference in London. Ah, the One Voice Conference in London was awesome. Uh, it was their very first event. It was run by um, the people behind Gravy for the Brain, which is um, an online training system. Um, but it was incredibly well organized. The content, the presenters, um, with the possible exception of me, uh, were all very, very um, uh, you know, well prepared and had incredibly useful information to to provide. And because there was a very different group of presenters than what I've been used to with North American conferences, it was really quite refreshing. 
And then they did the One Voice Awards on the Saturday night, which was a black tie thing. And it came off fabulously. Very, very well done. Very professional. I mean, you'd swear you were at the, uh, at the Academy Awards or something. Like they had, um, it, it, you know, multiple camera angles. And it was very, very well done. Um, the venue was, was delightful. A very cute little hotel right across from Canary Wharf uh, on the south side of the Thames. Um, would I highly recommend it next year if you um, were looking to invest some money and some training. Did they have different um, breakout sessions? Kind of was it set up kind of like VO Atlanta or, or was it uh, more of an everybody all together at once? <laughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Not at all. Um, it wasn't as large as VO Atlanta. Uh, VO Atlanta typically has, I think the last one had 600 people there in total. And I think that this one was about half that size. I think it was maybe 225 or 250 attendees. And then, you know, 50 of us that were, you know, presenters and, you know, facilitators, you know, panel discussions, that, thing, that kind of things. So um, there were absolutely breakout sessions, uh, but there, they didn't have quite, go quite as far as like the X sessions and things like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Graham, this is Randy in uh, Texas, south of Austin. Uh, really sorry to, to hear you uh, aren't feeling well, but it, it brings up a question that, that I kind of wonder when, when you're not well, when you've lost half your voice and you have a, uh, an audition the next day, how do you, how do you prepare yourself for it? What, what do you do? And maybe actually so that you don't have to, uh, to answer that, maybe somebody else can give us both some, uh, some pointers on, um, uh, how to manage a situation like you're going to be encountering tomorrow. Anybody have any thoughts? Any, anybody have any uh, good advice for me when it comes? To, I have tomorrow is, without exaggeration, the biggest single day I've had in my career in voiceover. I have two different television spots I have to record tomorrow in, in two different studios. So I, I'll tell you what I did, Graham. Uh, I have many years uh, traveling the world uh, doing live art auctions to hundreds of people in the audience and uh, lots and lots of money and you cannot have a hoarse voice and my best friend was the sauna so get your ass in the sauna turn it up hot breathe in the hot air and it'll get rid of all the nasty stuff in your nasal passages in your throat it always worked for me and uh, it's a good preventative measure as well i highly recommend a regular course of saunas once or twice a week get it nice and hot and kill all the nasty stuff in your throat and your nasal passages that's my advice Everyone keeps telling me to try a, a neti pot, but I just don't know if I can bring myself to do that. There's that personal steamer kind of thing that they're advertising on TV now. Uh, I've done that in the past with a little bit of um, a eucalyptus oil. Um, that helps, but it's only a temporary kind of thing, but it will help. Well, I've been drinking lots of honey and lemon tea that uh, my wife continues to force down my throat and uh, it seems to be helping somewhat. And, uh, you know, one of the two spots is it's a kind of an automotive, an automotive retail spot and they're looking for a fair amount of gravel and attitude anyway. So that one I'm not so worried about. It's the one in the morning I'm a little more concerned about. So. Um, so it doesn't, it always happen though, is that, you know, the biggest day in voiceover for me in my career and I'm sick for it. I'm going to echo what Dave said earlier here, Graham. The What's steam, that? Steam. Steam? Yes. As coming from a singing background, uh, and I'm going to add a little bit to that too, and you might not like it, but 
Bikram hot yoga is absolutely has been amazing for my voice and a couple of reasons why one is uh, it's 90 minutes long of sweating like you've never sweat in your life so really detoxifying which is great but the other aspect to it that I find because I I do so much voice work every week and on the weekends singing in my band and that's quite intense for long periods of time um, the stretch that you get they do a lot of back bends and it, it will stretch the scalene muscles in your neck really deeply and it actually has a really positive effect on um, just relaxing the muscles because you use them so much uh, and especially in your diaphragm too because it's, it's really a breathing practice is what it comes down to and vocalizing is as well but I'll echo Dave's uh, advice that steam is a great way to go but if you ever can convince yourself to step into a Bikram yoga hot room, you will kind of regret it until afterwards you feel better. I have done Bikram yoga before and I keep worrying I'm going to injure myself because you get so warm and so kind of limber that you think you can do things that, you know, once you cool down, you'll realize you shouldn't have done. Uh, that, that's, that's why you leave your ego at the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I did enjoy the heat. There's no doubt. I enjoyed the heat of the yeah. of Bikram when I did it. It's yeah, wonderful. So, um, and sorry, one one last thing with the steam. Um, this was recommended to me. If you can find it by tomorrow, good luck. Uh, it's called Olbaz oil, and it's a type of essential oil that's sort of a mixture of different essential oils. And you just put that into some hot water, throw a towel over your head, and just steam and and breathe it in, and it works very well too. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. What was the name of that essential oil again? It's called Old Baz Oil, and I believe it's O L B as in Bob A Z, I think, on the end. If it's not a Z, it's an S. And uh, I believe you can buy it on Amazon. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Haley. You're welcome yeah. and good luck. Graham, when I, I heard of uh, college basketball. back in the 80s as a voice major, uh, we gargled with uh, a, a salt water as warm as you can stand it, which will help, you know, soothe your throat a little bit. Don't swallow it. Just gargle with it and spit it out. I was hoping you were going to say you gargled with whiskey. <laughs> well, that was my other thing is massive quantities of alcohol. <laughs> that would have been a joke. Um. Thank you all for your advice, and I will be taking you up on it. Olbas, O-L-B-A-S. I'll be checking it out. Graham, have you tried Alkalol? Alkalol? A-L-K-A-L-O-L. No, but I'm making notes of all these things. It's a, it's a, it's a mucus solvent, so they may not be your problem. Uh, it's nasal wash, a natural soothing nasal wash, mucus solvent, and cleaner as I read it. It's all natural. Invented by some guy back in early 1900s for, uh, it's probably more for voices than anything, though. I don't know if it would help you with your cold. You can deduct the sauna when you install it off your taxes. <laughs> um, Have you tried, like, uh, rest and hydration in modern medicine? I have been doing all of those things for like okay, 10 years. Okay, great. Good. Um, I, I first fell ill a week ago Thursday, and it just won't go away, Michael. It just won't go away. Um, is, it maybe, of, is it allergies? No, it's not. It's, it's definitely a cold of some sort, or it's just sticking around. But enough about me. Who else has got a question for us tonight? Just I'm muting a few more people here. I have a question. Um, you guys earlier were talking about um, agents and it raised a question in my mind. I don't have an agent and I never thought I would need an agent since I'm not doing commercials. I'm not interested in doing commercials. And that was what my impression was from the training I've received in the past that if you're, you need an agent really, if you're going to be doing commercial work 
and if if I'm not doing commercial work, do I still need an agent? Like if I wanted to do other types of long form narration or e learning and that sort of thing, how important is an agent? Uh, it's less important, uh, certainly, because I think lots of long form narrate. Are you union or non union? Non union. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I, I still get a fair amount of work through my agent that's not commercial work. But you're right, the emphasis is there. And uh, so I think you can have a successful career as a voice actor doing long form narration, et cetera, without having an agent. Um, but it certainly wouldn't hurt. Okay. Thank yeah, you. There's, there's a lot of opportunities that are outside of commercial that, can, that agents can send you. Like if you're doing long form narration or something, you can get uh, you know, corporate training or corporate narration jobs through agencies and um, uh, stuff like that too. So it just depends on what your what genres you're in. Um, but I would say having a successful career without an agent is nowadays one prerequisite to, to getting one. So you should still try to have your own career even without them. Thank you. Who else has got some questions for us tonight? I've got one following up on the pay to plays. I got a, a weird email about two weeks ago from voices.com saying, Hey, uh, we want you to get more jobs. How about you audition more? And here's the success formula that most people are successful on voices.com have done. And here are the steps to do. I thought it was a nice email. Uh, and I, there's so many people on that site. I can't believe that they would reach out individually like that. I was impressed. Um, they have a fairly sophisticated outbound marketing program, out, outbound customer support program. Um, I'm not sure that they did reach out to you individually. I think that that, a version of that email probably went to, um, you know, many of the actors that hadn't auditioned more than X number of times in the previous X number of weeks or something like that. I They're, see. They have a very sophisticated, um, uh, platform that enables them to do all sorts of weird and wonderful magical things like that. So um, I'm not, uh, you know, could well have been something that was directed to you personally um, because they do have, you know, customer success managers or something like that. I can't remember what they're called, but um, I suspect it was probably one of their robo emails that get sent out to uh, actors that meet certain criteria, depending on the frequency of their auditioning, whether they're winning jobs or not, et cetera. Hi, Graham. This is Eric from uh, Richmond, Texas. Hello, Eric. Hey, howdy. Hey, listen, there's this company I've been hearing about called Cobalt Co. Has anybody heard about this company is supposed to be uh, making ordering a uh, voiceover simplified. What's it called again? Can you spell that for us? C O V O C O. Colvoco. And I went on, yeah, I went online to check it out. And it, if you're ordering a voice online, I mean, they got this slide bar that you slide over and it tells you how much you're going to pay for so many minutes, so many seconds, minutes or hours. And it really looks pretty simple, but I haven't heard too much about it and seems to be fairly new. Uh, just wondering if anyone's heard about it. A number of those types of sites, there are many of them out there, but they tend to be fairly low paying. Um, <clears throat> they don't, um, they don't, as a general rule, meet what, m what many would consider acceptable minimum standards for pricing, um, which is why most voice actors tend to tend to shun them. I will definitely take a look at that, though, and hopefully by the time I speak with you guys again next week, I'll, you know, maybe I'll do some digging around and see if I can come up with some information on them. I'm looking at it right now, and uh, 
it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, surprisingly. Uh, the, their pricing for a two-minute video uh, comes at $203, which is substantially more than a lot of these fly-by-night um, produ production companies. So uh, let's see what's a five-minute cost. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it is brand, brand new. I've never heard of it either. Um, okay. uh, Jim Beliakoff mentions that uh, Dave Cavassier wrote about it in his blog the other day. Oh. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Dave Cavassier, it's corvo.biz, C-O-R-V-O dot biz. I think that's how it's spelled. Looks like they'll pay nine hundred dollars for a thirty minute. I'm interested to see if that's what what I think it's probably going to be is that that's the cost for whoever's ordering it, and then the talent will probably get a small fraction of that amount. Um, I'm just uh, okay. I just put Dave Cavassier's. Uh, And someone was asking about VoiceCaster and VoiceCaster, as Michael answered in the chat box, is a, uh, a well-known voiceover casting operation out of Los Angeles. Well, given how I feel and that I can barely speak, um, and it's 8.57, so I'm going to uh, call it a night here tonight. Thanks, uh, Graham. Oh, no, thank, thank you all. Uh, it was so glad, uh, so glad that so many of you were able to show up, considering it was Mother's Day and all. I hope that you all, uh, those of you who are mothers, I hope you had a great day. And those of you who uh, have mothers, make sure that you get off the phone here and call them. Um, so until next you week. better, Graham. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, better. yeah, feel better, Graham. Thank you. I appreciate that, everybody. Um, it's honest, Stan. Book lots of work. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. See you next week.